On today's episode of Survival Dispatch News, we're discussing protecting your home. And we're back with today's panel. Beside me here, we've got our good friend, Jason McCoy. And can I please reiterate something? None of us on this panel are going to take Joe Biden's advice and take a double barrel shotgun and fire two shots in there because that does no good. <laughs> I thought that's all we were going to discuss. <laughs> Crap, we're done. I mean, maybe if it's that <laughs> a drone. Radio. Just, just get a shotgun fired twice. <laughs> you're good to go. Uh, we're joined by Mike Sterling. Of course, uh, anybody who follows Survival Dispatch News, familiar with him. Denny Chapman as well. You know, our uh, in-house firearm subject matter expert and Chris from ammo.com, who's going to be taking the lead on today's uh, episode. So take it away, Chris. Thank you, Chris. It's great to be here. And uh, like we're talking about today, we're going to talk about defending our castle from the foreign invaders who are coming in. And as Jason so eloquently said, yeah, more than double barrel shotguns. But uh, I want to take a second just to talk about something that's really important. I need to emphasize that none of us here are lawyers. We don't know your state and local laws, and we're not re responsible for any misinterpretations on your part of those laws. You need to get with your local law enforcement and understand what is appropriate and what isn't. And I know, Mike, you're thinking about it, but all of the federal laws regarding booby trapping <laughs> your property are strictly enforced no matter where you live. Uh, so we're going to have to leave all of the fun stuff out, out of this one, sadly. I know that you you had your uh, your little toy you wanted to show us beforehand, but uh, yeah, we, we can't be using those, sadly. I'm sorry. So, so, so Use right your imagination. Gate, yeah, right out of the gate, we've got the number one bomb thrower throwing a bomb at the number one bomb expert. <laughs> sorry. No, it's good. It's good. No, I love it. I'm glad we could all be here today. And I wanted to start and talk about uh, one topic that I think is important to really talk about here in the preparedness community is understanding the difference between everyday home defense and home defense during a disaster or an SHTF situation, because I think we have to approach those two very differently. So uh, I want to pass this one off to, to Denny, get your opinion. I what is your big differentiation between those two topics? Well, yeah, that's a that's a really good point because um, different uh, things that are happening to us dictate uh, how we're going to address those issues. And, uh, you know, we can talk about this for a long time, but in a nutshell, you know, we're talking about defending your castle and, you know, basically defending your home, your property, your family members uh, against people who want to do bad things and, and hurt you or, or kill you. Um, when we have these uh, Mother Nature scenarios. You know, I'm down here in Florida. We have hurricanes. Hurricane seasons actually um, kicks up here in just a couple of days for us down here. And uh, then that brings the worry about uh, looters and people, you know, doing crazy stuff during during the bad weather when when uh, doors and locks may not work anymore and buildings are blown down and people's possessions are available for the taking, so to speak, and people can storm your castle a little easier in those circumstances. So it's important to understand that, you know, we're addressing a general topic here, but, you know, the circumstances will change depending on, you know, what, what's going on. And so there are a lot of things we can do, generally speaking, to prepare to defend your castle and then special things that um, you probably should take in consideration in those other scenarios uh, where we might encounter looters, rioters, et cetera. No, it's a great way to put it. I think that, uh, you know, one thing to really remember is like for everyday defense is when things are normal, you know, law enforcement will respond to your calls in a timely manner. Uh, you know, emergency services are, kind of still working and the courts are in session. I think that's the most important thing to remember because uh, as we like to say, every every time you squeeze the trigger, there's a lawyer attached to that. So just be aware of that when that happens. And I think, you know, kind of one of the important things to do to really get your house ready. So let's talk about everyday defense. So like anytime, like right now, everything's good. The grid is up. Uh, everybody's happy. You know, we're getting checks sent to us, you know, from all of our three letter government agencies that we love here. And we want to make sure that our house is ready to go. And one quote that I think really talks about this is, you know, from the art of war, it says the greatest victory is one that requires no battle. So really making your home look like a hard target. So you're not easy pickings. Cause I think that's an important thing when if during a normal situation, 
Uh, you know, thieves, let's be honest, thieves and people who want to do this harm mostly are cowards. And if you look like a hard target, then you'd be like, I don't want to go after that. So, uh, Mike, give me your thoughts. What are some good ways to make your home look more like a hard target and less accessible to people who might want to do bad things to us? Okay, so uh, some of you might not know, but I started out my uh, I started out my days as a as a combat engineer. So uh, fortifications, uh, survivability, counter mobility, mobility uh, tasks were part and parcel for of my life for five years. So I built a lot of fortifications. So there's a couple of things. There's there's three points that you really need to you need to consider with these things, and um and and this this falls for for your considerations for for all of these things. But you've got time, manpower, and material availability. The everything that you do is going to be levied against those. Now, uh, when it, when it, time is time, period. Um, manpower, of course, that can be that can be improved by mach- use of machinery, uh, and material. Uh, material you also have to throw money into there as well because fortifications can either be you know you can you can throw a ton of money at fortifications and and man you can have a great place you know i mean if you've got a house with you know 24 inch thick reinforced concrete walls you know i mean you're 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 doing great but guess what the 99.9 percent of us can't afford that sort of thing so money is a consideration on this sort of thing and then there's one more thing that i need to throw into there is legal and social norms if you happen to if god help you if you happen to live in a neighborhood with an hoa uh. the 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 stuff that you're going to do is gonna have to be levied against what how much pain you're willing to deal with from the hoa okay and that's that's just that's life um so of course um first you have to define your vulnerabilities so and you have to levy those against what threats you're looking to to you know go up against you know having a regular stick built suburban house you're not going to go up against tanks you're not going to reinforce it against mortars or anything it's just it's just not going to happen um you have to understand that bullets are just going to penetrate regular walls it's going to happen you got stick built house Bullets are just going through the walls, period. Um, so a couple of things that you can do, and um, when I was doing vulnerability assessment stuff, we used to call it fortification landscaping, and it's a beautiful thing. Um, so you can build flower beds outside of of your house, but the bottom two-thirds or three-quarters of that, it's a raised flower bed, the bottom, bottom three-quarters is concrete, just a block of concrete. So... And we used to put those. We used to put those around uh, facilities that that had a vulnerability for people driving, you know, car bombs up into them, stuff like that. So it looks really pretty, but it's actually an anti-vehicle barrier. But guess what? Anti-vehicle barriers also stop bullets, so those work too. Um, decorative rocks and concrete features, right? Um, stuff like that. Those work good. Um, if you're in a neighborhood and you have the opportunity to have a neighborhood that you can be able to close off. Out near those, you build swales, and you can pass that off to your HOA as, oh, we're building a swale because it's a, it's, and that's basically just a, a raised section of bed, uh, and we can plant flowers and trees and stuff like that on it because you know it's landscaping, right? But guess what? A swale is also a great fighting position. So if you need to close off your neighborhood, great place to be able to build those sort of things. Um, thorn hedges are a beautiful thing. And you can put those in your backyard, stuff like that. Hey, I don't know about you, but I've crawled over a wall and fallen into a thorn hedge. Or if you live in the Southwest, throw a whole bunch of cactus <laughs> in there. Now so that's going to deter just about anybody. If they do get over it and they fall into that, they are not going to want to yeah. do it. for. They're not going to want to do anything once they're in there. Uh, well, palmettos the, down here in Florida, those palmettos are... Right. Ouch. Yeah, those palmettos will tear you up, man. So those are a big, you know, those those are some good things. Another thing that I like to throw on, and I was a big fan of for the longest time, was um, mylar sheeting on your windows. So in a um, in a shooting environment, probably fifty percent of your casualties are actually going to come from flying glass. Um, now, if you just take thin mylar sheeting, and it doesn't need to be tinted mylar or anything like that. Um, if you can only do it, just do it on one side, on the inside, preferably. Um, and that will make that window one monolithic piece. So if you have if you have a blast outside or if you have bullets coming through, the glass isn't going to be flying all over the house, right? It's basically just a thin mylar sheet, just a thin clear plastic sheet that's going to go 
go over it, it's going to hold it in place. If you see pictures from World War II uh, or anything like that, you know, you'll see you'll see tape crosses on all the windows and stuff. And that's that's the the particular use of that is so that windows don't go shattering all over the place. Well, mylar is is a is a big step above. Now, if you can do both sides of that window, man, you are in great shape. Um, now, of course. Uh, and and this became this became a big thing after the Kobar Towers bombing in Saudi Arabia back in the in the 90s. For anybody that happens to remember that, 75 uh, percent of the casualties in that um, were injured specifically because of flying glass. And guess what? You can't pick up glass on an X-ray machine. It's got to get dug out by hand by a surgeon. So that's that's all bad news. So if you can if 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 that's all you can do, and that's cheap. Clear mylar is stupid cheap. Apply it yourself. Put it on. Call it a day. Um, so that's a that's a big one. I think one of the biggest issues, though, that is nigh on impossible to fix for virtually all of us is fire. You make your house hard enough for somebody else to get in. Eventually, they're going to decide to just burn you out. So don't make it too tough for them to get in. Because if you make it impossible for others to get in, you've now just made it impossible for yourself to get out. Good thought. I hadn't thought about that. This definitely applies more to the the SHTF home defense for sure. But no, I really like that, especially the window screens. I think that's really something that could help uh, and a very inexpensive thing that you can do. And it also slows somebody down. If somebody's trying to come in your window, uh, you know, that will slow them down. And like you're saying, time is an important thing in a defense situation. You need time to get ready. You may be asleep and you need time to get to the gun safe or get your, uh, you know, your defensive tools out, whatever you want to use. Uh, that screen could give you those precious seconds that you need to be able to get there and get it done. Uh, another thing I think that's really helpful is, to, uh, you know, upgrade your door locks uh, and get those bigger screws in there because that's a real weak point of a lot of deadbolts. I know a lot of people think, oh, I got a deadbolt on the door. It's good to go. But you've got one inch screws in the thing and it's fairly simple for someone who knows what they're doing to kick a door down. Uh, so getting beefier locks like that's a really great thing you can do. And just getting screws, they're like 10 cents a piece at any big box hardware store. Do that. It'll take you five minutes and you'll be considerably tougher than what you think. Yeah, Mike, go ahead, buddy. Uh, also, an addition onto that uh, top and top and bottom slide bolts. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Good luck kicking that through. For sure, for sure. Yeah. And on top of that, um, you can get decorative metal storm doors now. Mm -hmm. so it doesn't look like, uh, you know, you're in downtown Miami, you know, with bars on the windows, but outswing solid metal. We've got them on our main doors. Uh, you know, target hardening is all about layers and the layers are all about slowing the other person down or discouraging them from hitting your place because the neighbor's easier target. Those metal doors for a couple hundred dollars are extremely effective. You're going to buy a serious amount of time with them, especially, like I said, they're outswing, they're, they're solid, but they don't look, you know, it doesn't look like you're going into a prison. Yeah, Denny, go for it. Yeah, and uh, on on Mike's note, um, if you're, if you live in a neighborhood or a, a subdivision and your HOA will allow it, um, put a fence up. It's not going to keep them out, but it's going to slow them down. I'm lucky because I live out in the boonies. Uh, I have a large property. Uh, I have fence all around my property. Uh, anybody can get in, but it's going to slow them down. And odds are I'm going to be alerted to that and be, have a little more time to prepare. So simply having a fence, you know, I've got four foot uh, no climb fence because my property is designed for, for animals. And, uh, you know, you could hop over it, but it'll slow them down. I've got gates on my front drive. Yeah, you could drive a vehicle through it, but it'll slow people down. Locks and gates and fences and things, you know, typically are designed to keep honest people out. But these reinforcements that we're talking about will slow the, the non-honest people down that much more. No, you're absolutely right, Denny. And I think that's a great thing to do now. Uh, Chris, I know you had something you kind of wanted to show off. Uh, one of the other things you can do, especially during a time where, you know, every day things are happening, law enforcement is still there. It's always good to, you know, have things that you can record, uh, maybe what's happening in case there is a type of a court situation. So having security cameras and floodlights and stuff like that can be really important if things go uh, to a judgment of 12. So, Chris, what do you have for us? Can I, can I make a point on yep. that right before Chris shows this? You know, we all 
preach this situational awareness with with our individual selves when we're out in public. This what Chris is fixing to show is our home's situational awareness, especially if we have updates and alerts that you know allow us to be able to see what's going on outside of our home when we're not there, or it, especially when we are there. Um, it's situational situational awareness for our home itself. That's in my opinion. So, yeah. So we're at our cabin in the Blue Ridge Mountains, middle of nowhere. Um, so we have a combination of trail cams as well as regular network cameras. And I'm fixing to install some more today. Uh, this one, my wife likes the Zoom app. It's pretty good. Uh, we picked up a couple of these uh, motion detector lights, motion detector camera, but you can log in anytime. A uh, couple hundred bucks a piece. These, these will be hardwired into a circuit that's on a power station battery backup as well. And the reason that we're adding these in addition to the other cameras is that some of our trail cameras have big solar panels on them. You're not going to disguise them. People can see where they are. And uh, we had somebody jack with our cameras from behind them. So we got a notification and we could hear them rustling around, but the camera moved like that. And then we could no longer see a portion of our property here. So the way I've got things set up now and with the addition of, of these two cameras, every camera is covered by at least one additional camera, in many cases, two cases. So if somebody messes with a camera, they're going to be caught on camera by another camera. Um, the other thing is I had a, a vehicle break into my uh, home maybe 10 years ago or so. And uh, when I was talking to the responding officer, he said, you know, you can drive through this neighborhood and tell immediately who's been broken into and who hasn't. Because the ones that have been broken into have motion detector lights everywhere, lit up like a dang Christmas tree. So both, you know, here in our place in Florida, we got solar lights all over the place, motion detector lights. Um, you know, bad guys don't like a spotlight being shined on them. Absolutely. Bad things always happen in the dark. Uh, that's for sure. And they, you know, like I said, bad people during good times want to be anonymous. They don't want to know that you're there. Uh, now, another early warning system, Jason, I want to talk to you about this one because I know you've got a, a couple of puppies yourself, uh, is to get a dog. So uh, what are your thoughts on that? So I believe, you know, almost all dogs are going to alert you if something is aloof outside. Um, even if it's somebody that is a family member that's coming in, as soon as you breach it or come up to that door, they're going to alert you. I have, oh goodness, I have two kind of Corsos that um play around in my backyard they have full range through the doggy door to come inside and outside um my oldest male he's two he's 150 pounds he's a force to be reckoned with um uh i have a female um she's just a little over a year old right now she's a hundred pound county corso um they they're deterrents to say the least but also on the other hand don't think you've got to have a big vicious dog to do that I've also got a Chihuahua inside and a Chihuahua. They're just as loud and boisterous as the Cane Corsos are. Cane Corsos are going to put the fear of God in anybody that comes on the outside. But the Chihuahua and the Chihuahuas, they are, oh my gosh, those little rascals will, they'll alert us in a heartbeat. If anything, you will never sneak past one. It's That's like right. sneaking past a goose. <laughs> the, what the great part about dogs is, it, is they can sense things are wrong even without hearing us hearing a sound. That's what I really love about animals. So. Yeah. I'd like to expound on that, you know, working in the animal industry uh, with horses and dogs and uh, you know, backing up a little bit, two of the best deterrents are light and dogs uh, light because we discussed, you know, most bad things happen in the dark because people don't want to be seen. They don't want to be recognized. Uh, so then, then the dogs come into play, and we think about this: that dogs having a dog uh, will alert you to somebody being in the proximity of your home or wherever you're at. As Jason said, it doesn't necessarily have to be a big, mean-sounding dog. It could be a it could be a little dog. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, we have a lot of dogs. You know, we work with dogs as a family business as well. And uh, we have Boston Terriers, for instance, and uh, they don't sound mean, but they will alert us. And if we can hear them barking, the bad guys can hear them barking. And that might be just enough deterrence to say, well, maybe I'll skip this place because they already know we're here. 
Now, if you got a dog like Jason's uh, Corso dogs, they are big, mean ass looking dogs. They can be mean depending on how you train them. But one of those dogs barking or a German Shepherd, the German Shepherd bark is highly recognizable because of movies and television. Yep. Uh, people uh, have, hear, people know what canines sound like. They know what Malinois sound like versus a, a German Shepherd. Even a larger dog like a Labrador barking is going to be more of a deterrent than a smaller dog barking. So dogs, absolutely, yes. It's a bonus if you have a larger dog just moving more air through their lungs, making more noise. Um, Chris has pit bulls. Uh, they sound really freaking mean when they bark. It is a huge deterrent. I go to Chris's once a week. We make content. The dogs bark when I ring his ring doorbell. Um, I, those dogs sense me before I even hit that button. And they sound like I don't want to go in there, even though I know them and they, they, I get along with those dogs. So just want to expound on that. Being a dog guy, get yourself. If you don't have a dog, get yourself a dog. Two dogs are better than one. Yeah, Jason. I want to make a point on that for some of the listeners that you know may not be dog or may be dog owners and just not know – um, that this is a fact. If your dog is doing that at the door, even when a family member comes in, please don't tell them to stop mm -hmm. because they're doing you a service. Um, mm -hmm. They're Good working point. for you. Mm -hmm. You know, once that family member, that person comes in, yes, socialize them with that person and make sure everything's cool, but don't discipline that dog for doing its job. And that's something like, even like what you said, Danny, um, Chris's dogs, they're up here with us this weekend or this week. Sorry. And, um, even when I go outside to get something out of the truck, bring it back in his female sitting right there at the door and she's growling at me. As soon as I come through the door, I reached yep. out and tell her, good job, girl. Good job. Once I, yeah. once I reach that door though, she knows who I am because I've been around her, you know, yeah. but she's doing her job. Your animals are doing their, don't discipline, discipline them for doing something that is for your service. Yeah, well, yeah, dog, that's true. Dog handlers will tell you, uh, do not use the word stop with a dog unless that's, you know, what you want them to do. Like, you know, if you want them to stop dead in their tracks, use the word stop, but don't use that for something like, you know, Jason's example. It confuses them. And, you know, you're trying to uh, take away their instinct of protecting their pack. As you can see flying around us here, Chris has also got two pit bulls and a lot of um yellow jackets. Yellow, no other wasps. <laughs> it's the to, you know, people to come break Take in. cover if you need to, boys. I want to wanna expound on the I want to expound on the dog thing a little bit too. And having had experience handling working dogs and canines, I can tell you that's a whole different world and a whole different responsibility. So if you think you're just going to go out and buy yourself a trained um, working dog, a dog that you know, will bite on command or alarm on command. You are opening up a, a can of worms that you need to be able and prepared and trained to deal with. And I'll give you a real quick story and then we'll move on. So I'm a big fan of Schutzen dogs. And so I had a Czech bred shepherd. He's long since passed away and one of the best dogs I ever had. And uh, he was level three. So he would alarm on command. He would bite on command. He, was, he could also uh, sniff out drugs and do a lot of cool things that us former police officers like dogs to do. Well, I had this dog and I had some friends over and they knew I had this wonderfully trained dog and he was off leash with me while my friends were there. And they wanted to say, Hey, show us, show us what your dog can show us some cool stuff. And so I said, you know, okay. So I had him do some very simple commands and um, he was trained. He, he, we used German commands with him, with that particular dog. And uh, at one point I gave him the command to alarm, which means bark loudly. Uh, and we use that as a deterrent and as a predecessor to the next thing that happens, which is go bite the crap out of somebody. And so I did that. And as I did that, I'm, t I'm telling you guys this because I learned a lesson from this. I gave my dog off leash the command to alarm. And um, wasn't the best thing in the world for me to do because my friend's wife was, this was in the fall. She was wearing a big bulky uh, sweatshirt and she turned her arm like she turned her arm to, to say something to her husband. And it looked like she was presenting a bite sleeve to my dog. And my dog's uh, bite word was pucken, which is a very common word um, used in military and law enforcement for these um, dogs to, to bite. And I don't, somebody said something with a puck. 
And he said, he said, Oh yeah. Okay. And he goes, he lunged, he lunged at her, the big, big old German shepherd. And I caught him by the scruff of the neck and I put him on the ground at the last second. So long story short, that's, that's a fun story of mine. Long story short is if you're going to go out and buy one of these protective dogs, you need a lot of training and you need to be prepared to change your lifestyle completely for that dog. So that's a liability just like a round is. Yeah, and they have a mind of their own, which guns do not. Right. I'd like to mm-hmm. point out. So, you know, that's a, that's a we we should pro- that's a whole nother video for survival dispatch. Maybe we'll do that. No, that's a really good point, and yeah, great insights on the uh, the puppers. I we have a German Shepherd. She's thankfully taking a nap, so hopefully you won't be subjected to that bark that we were talking about earlier. <laughs> Everybody knows talk- that Shepherd bark. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I she it's when she gets going. Oh yeah, it very it very much is. So, but dogs, uh, now, yes, dogs and light, good, good deterrence for bad people. Definitely, hundred percent, fully recommended here at Survival Dispatch. Now, let's. We were talking about firearms that they don't have a mind of their own. And uh, shameless plug: if you need some ammo, check out ammo.com. We'd appreciate it a lot. Hey, and don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe. It helps us with the algorithm. Absolutely. Make sure you're doing that and uh, leave us your comments as to what your favorite uh, tool for home defense is. We'd love to see that. Uh, and let's let's step it up a notch here. Let's get to, OK, we're in an SHTF situation. Things are bad. We need to become an even harder target than we were before. And I'm sure you all heard the distinctive bark of the German Shepherd earlier. I tried to mute it for you as quick as I could. Uh, but in that case, I got another art of war for art of. Oh, wow. Editor fix that for me. I've got another art of war quote for you. Victorious warriors win first and then go to war, while defeated warriors go to war first and then seek to win. So, Mike, talk to us a little bit more about hardening your house, your castle. Now we're in a a pretty bad situation. What are you looking at doing? So if you look at um, if you look at a lot of the uh, the lessons out of Sarajevo, uh, that Selko talks about uh, during the during the siege there. One of the things that they did, and it was it was an easily easily ac- uh, acquirable material, was large quantities of brick and stuff like that laying around. They just took that stuff and mounted it up on the outside of their house. So of course the the um, you know you that that's a good thing for hardening. Um, and you have to look at you have to look at at this from a um, from a counter mobility standpoint so you've got three different types of barriers uh and and um we're gonna just break these down so you've got delay and deter right which of course you know it's a barrier it's it's not meant to stop them it's going to slow them down or it's going to tell them "Mm, i don't think i want to go in here right um the next thing of course is going to be to channel them what i'm trying to do is i'm trying to move them out of one of my blind spots and push them directly into a field of fire preferably where i am uh enfilading or or you know putting them into a good little crossfire which is a nice thing um and then you've got barriers that are just downright going to stop them okay um but hardening hardening your uh, a, a normal american stick built house is a difficult thing it really honestly is the best thing that you can have um, which so much of the so much of the, the the nation can't do is defense in depth. Um, so we're talking about we're talking about you know for most Americans we're talking about um, suburban neighborhoods. So essentially your your engagement range is pretty much down to the street. You know, um, so you're looking at maybe twenty five yards tops. Mm. That's difficult. That's real difficult right there. Uh, if somebody wants in bad enough, and this is the one thing that we always said when it was when we were doing uh, um, VIP security, if somebody wants you bad enough, they're going to get you, period. Um, so, you know, yeah, okay, great. I got my Barrett, and I'm going to shoot holes in any car that comes up here. Well, guess what? Somebody's going to come by with a dump truck and drive it through your house at a certain point. You know, I mean, you just you... You can't stop everything. So understand that up front. You cannot stop everything. Now, what you can do is you can take the you can take the 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 pyramid of vulnerability, and you may be able to cut that bottom slice off. 
if you can cut that bottom slice off, that's going to be 80, 90% of the stuff that, you know, you're going to wind up dealing with. So of course, you know, deter somebody from hitting your place, make it look like a hard spot. Um, another thing is camouflage, make the place look completely dilapidated, falling down that nobody lives there. And it's just not worth going into. Okay. Camouflage is camouflage, right? Um, and, and then that's when you go to your other stuff of, of barriers and the like. Now, one thing, uh, if you look, there's a, there's a wonderful little, uh, there's a wonderful little barrier system that the Romans used to use. And I always loved this. It was great. They, uh, they would plant these very short, uh, but wide, uh, thorn hedges outside of their forts, but they would plant them a distance apart so you might be able to jump over one of them but you're not going to get enough speed to get over the next one all right uh so these 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 fat thorn hedges they'll they'll provide co concealment but not cover um so that makes things difficult right there um and you know throw a little bit of you know throw yourself some uh some chunks of steel in there nobody's going to be able to drive through that very easily um it's it like i said it all comes down to protect yourself from what you can protect yourself from but be prepared because again 90 percent of the houses in the united states are susceptible to fire and it doesn't even have to be they don't even have to if you're in a tight suburban neighborhood they don't even have to set your house on fire set a house on fire two doors down it's going to spread right they may burn your whole neighborhood down just to get at you so things to be aware of um and i mean i think that's why it's always good to have a backup plan have right. your your bag ready to go in case something like that happens that's completely out of your control in a disaster situation like that you don't know what's going to happen and you may need to bug out uh right. now of course obviously most of us are planning to bunker in that's what we're talking about today but there may come that situation where you just like, okay, we got to go because we can't control the situation. Yeah, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to make an honest assessment of your security situation. And I mean, I've got a couple of friends that that they're in neighborhoods that their security situation is, as soon as it goes to a without rule of law situation in their area, they have to leave. Their area cannot be secured. There's too many angles to be able to to be able to cover. Um, and, and, but, and they don't have enough trigger pullers. And that's one of the biggest, that's one of the biggest problems. If you've just got two of you, you can't stay awake all the time and, and you can't stay in condition orange all the time. You can't do it. Um, not when there's just a couple of you and you, you, you can only cover two angles at that point, you know? So if there's a, if there's a couple of you, you can only cover two angles. So you only have two options, either don't defend that area or active defense and active defense is not is not plausible in this kind of a scenario in a in a suburban scenario you just active defense is not a thing so you're not going to be able to go out and maneuver and and patrol aggressively you're just not going to be able to do that so unless of course you get a whole bunch more neighbors you know on on on. on and that's that's honestly in in a in a suburban or even urban environment that's probably one of the absolute best things that you can do is preparation in advance and organize if you've now you now what you're doing is you're adding combat multipliers onto yourself if you got the more multipliers that you have in your scenario now you've got more trigger pullers now you've got more eyes now you've got more people that can stay awake that'd okay. be a great that'd be a great topic for another news like how to organize that sort of thing denny i saw you said you wanted to, to add something there mike said it develop a okay. network of like-minded people with with skills and equipment to to band together it may not be you may not be the it may not be your last stand but it could be the uh the reason why you survive a little bit longer until you get to that next place you need to get to so mike said it yeah, a little bit more irony. One of the other magazines from Off Grid that was in that stack that I found that one in, on the cover said, "How to build a survival network." <laughs> nice. <laughs> Obviously, that's what we're going to need to talk about sometime here on the show. Awesome. That's a great, great topic. topic, and and it is honestly one of the absolute most difficult tasks that it you is. are ever going to tackle. Yeah, it, it, it is really absolutely is. difficult. It's it's you would think it's no fun. You're, you're, you're right. You would. Making sure they're properly trained, making sure everybody's yep. on 
Hey, it's good, guy. I can yeah. it's just trying to get easy. people to, to not choke each other is a big thing. <laughs> yeah. but, you know, amongst themselves. Yeah, they, my grandpa used to say Florida starts at Jacksonville and ends at St. Augustine, and everything south there's an extension of Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and New York. <laughs> and so our home in Florida is an older, established uh, um, suburb, and uh, we, we got some people from the northeast there that are vehemently – you know, against guns, they, they, they're like the hall monitor people. If there's a trailer in your driveway for more than 24 hours, they're bitching and moaning and complaining about shit like that. <laughs> the neighborhood <laughs> Karens. Just on principle alone, I'm not protecting them and they're not getting any of my dang supplies, period. Full stop. <laughs> your own. Yeah. So anyway. So if I can add one more little thing onto what Denny was talking about, um, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, you know, I've got the memory of a goldfish, so I'm, I'm kind of bouncing back on this whole thing. Um, one of the things that I would strongly suggest, and even in a even in an SHTF situation, you can have all the guns in the world, right? But if you don't have the training on it, of course, they're worthless, right? Um, but another thing that that is a very profound thing is it, that a lot of people forget gun lights. So oh, yeah. there was a there's a, a terrible situation where a where a father woke up in the middle of the night, heard something going on in his house, goes downstairs, um, got his got his 20 gauge shotgun, spots somebody walking around his house that's not supposed to be there. Because, of course, on his way down, he checks his wife, you know, he checks to make sure that his spouse is there. He checks to make sure that his daughter is there. Find somebody downstairs. that's not there. No lights, no nothing guy friggin goes goes terminal on this ki- on this guy smokes him right there in the living room turns out it's the girlfriend's or it's the daughter's boyfriend oh lord who was staying over and this guy did not acquire PID positive identification you need to get positive identification on who okay. you're going to shoot even if it's you tap that light just before you pull the trigger right get PID one it's going to keep it's going to keep you out of jail mm. right now. Okay. Uh, later on, it's going to keep you from shooting one of your own people. And yeah. if you're using a, if you're using your weapon light appropriately, well, you've just stunned them for about a good second, second and a half. Yep. So one, you're getting PID and two, you're making sure that they're not going to be able to hit back at you accurately. Um, it is a, it is a big thing. And I, I don't have a gun in my house that doesn't have a light on it period everybody gets a light everybody gets flash before i move on yeah and i would say i would like to say this as well i've got uh as i said i live out in the country with I, i've got multiple switches around my house that will light up the outside of my house uh like like daylight actually daylight times 10 with the flip of a switch so I can immediately get PID on anybody that's outside. And and that's one of the first things I'm going to do inside as well is get those lights on as well. I want to get Chris and Jason's opinion on this. I want to talk about signage. Uh, You know, we saw a lot in Katrina, right, where people would make signs and be like, you know, you loot, we shoot, that sort of thing. In an SHTF situation, do you think that this is a, a good deterrent or does it kind of say, hey, there's guns here. It's not a good idea to, or you know, we you have supplies and we can loot you. What are your guys' know, thoughts on that? I don't know about you guys, but guess what? Guess who lives in my house? Me and my wife. I don't know how many criminals are, are capable of ganging together coming after me and my stuff. And then I could potentially have to fight off 10, 20 um, people that are armed as well. If I let them know, Hey, you loot, we, you know, you loot, we shoot. That is exactly what you're doing. You're saying, Hey, this guy's got more firearms for us. Let's go get his stuff. You know, that's just my personal opinion. I, like, I don't put any kind of, um, pro gun stickers on my vehicle, things like that. I, I just, I, I, I like to avoid it, stay away from it at all costs because I don't want to have, I don't want to ever have to get in a fight. Okay. So let's avoid it. At, at all costs. Yeah, I'm in agreement. Out of sight, out of mind. You know, don't draw attention to yourself. I want it to be a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we want, we train we train to be dangerous. We're yeah. we're dangerous individuals, uh, yeah. and and we train. And you should train to be dangerous. Train to be as dangerous as you can be, uh, without uh, and without seeking out conflict. Yeah, 100%. You know, I heard a quote from just talking about this. Even you know, 
it goes with home defense too. Um, Jocko Link made a quote a couple of how long ago it was, but he said, you know, if if somebody approaches me out in public and they're bad mouthing me, I can walk away. I mean, I, I could be armed to the teeth. I could kick this guy's tail in. It doesn't matter. I can walk away, and that's what I want to do. If he throws a punch at me, I've still got time to get away. I can escape. The only time that you're going to force me not to escape and fight back is if you grab me, one of my family members, or if you pull a weapon, okay? I don't want to fight somebody even coming in my home. But if you come in my home, I don't know your intent. If my family's there, I only have one recourse, and that's protect myself and protect my loved ones in that house. I don't know what your intent is, and, it, you know, you just messed up. You grabbed me. Yeah, <laughs> but if somebody breaks into your house, they have bad intent. 100%. That's a, that's a safe assumption. Yeah, 100%. You know, so that, sure. they're you put me in a position where now I have to react. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're an immediate candidate for high speed lead poison. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, Chris, what do you think about signers like that? Would you, would you put a sign out that says uh, you loot, we shoot? No, no. I mean, look at our escalate. It's completely blacked out. There's no stickers. There's not a dang thing on it that, you know, identifies us as, you know, two a guys or anything. No. Yeah. I, but okay. I, I, I get that. Off. I get that. I agree with that. I don't have anything on my mind as well uh, for exactly that reason. But let's say things are, do go bad. We do have an HTF scenario, and then you have, and then people start looting. Then would you, then would you throw paint a big sign and put it out in your front yard? Still not. Okay. No, um, I'm just I, curious. I would prefer that they go to somebody else's house under the radar. And you know, Mike made the best point of them all is that if those people get focused on you they'll burn you out of your own dang house and there's nothing you can, you can't stop that. So, you know, just not draw the attention and uh, just stay vigilant, be aware, you know, and have that community of, of, you know, network of people, hopefully in immediate proximity in your neighborhood so yeah. that you can band together. But yeah, no, I, I don't care what the keyboard warriors want to say down below. The best fight is the fight that never yeah. end the story. Yeah. of things i just wanted to hit on real quick like if you have to fight within your home make sure that you're setting it up so that you have the advantage i think this is one thing that we may not think about but mike kind of hinted on is talking about making these fatal funnels pushing the enemy where you want them to go so that you can be set up because if they're coming into your home they have no idea what your home setup is they don't know what it looks like what the floor plan is so use that to your advantage make sure that you're trying to you know direct uh, that, you know, someone with ill intent, where you want them to go so that you can be ready to go. Kind of like Mike was talking about interlocking fields of fire. That always sounds uh, like a it, good deterrent. Yeah. And just to be clear, because there were some questions in a previous video with regards to what is a fatal funnel. The simplest mm -hmm. example is forcing somebody to go through a doorway. You know, so you have massive advantage on the other side. They have to step into that fatal funnel, you know, to, to progress, which is why clearing buildings is so dangerous and and so hard to do so anyway basically hurting people through a choke point that makes them an easier target than you are you're taking away their options for maneuvering and making them go to one place which you've already got muzzles pointed at which is a very bad place to be unless you've got flashbangs and stuff like that to be able to pump into the place and most of us i'm not saying all of us Mike, don't have access to cool stuff like flashbangs and stuff like that. Most, most of us, we're not, we're not going to say which one may have, but yeah, may possibly may potentially possibly. have. <laughs> you know, Mike, that's a. a I'm a devout pacifist. Thank you very much. I, I want to ask tell. you about that fatal funnel because I consider what. Okay, another thing about if SHTF situation does happen, and somebody is attempting to come in my home. Okay. Communication is key between me and my wife, okay? It's my job as a husband. I'm not being chauvinist or anything like that. It's my job as a protector, as a man, the husband of, of the household. You know, that's just the way I was raised, and that's the way we do things. My wife's job, she has a rifle of her own, a pistol on her nightstand just as well. But her job is to get on the phone, call 911, and she sits with her rifle pointed at the door while she's on with 911 explaining the situation. She is to shoot anybody that comes through that bedroom door 
unless it's me and you know we'll be communicating throughout the whole thing but it's my job to go around the house would you consider that to be a fatal funnel as far as our our bedroom yeah that's usually um that's usually what you call a fallback fatal funnel that's your that's your quote unquote that's your alamo um yeah. or whatever whatever is the hardest part of your house if you can get into the basement whatever um personally my preference is if you can if you can get into training, if you don't have anybody else in the house, but you and your spouse, right. maybe you two ought to, ought to be training to stack up on each other yep. and I mean, work I would love multiple to get angles that. while you clear the house. Because yeah, I'll tell I'd you what, you, you hit a, I, like, like I've got a T hallway mm -hmm. in my place. I hate going into T's by myself right. because I got to choose left or right. Yep. But if you can do you and right. your spouse, mm -hmm bump that T corner by, you know, at the same time, man, that takes away a lot of your vulnerabilities right there. It covers up, it covers up, uh, dead spots. You don't know if you miss somebody behind you and, you know, so, so, okay. So now we're working, now we're working a single hallway. What's that person behind you doing? Right. They're flipped six. Yep. yep. They're covering behind you. So man, that, that makes life a whole lot better. But everybody's got to be on board to be able to do that. Everybody's right. got to have the skills and the training to do that. If they don't have that, if you're if your spouse isn't on board for that kind of thing, you know what? I get it. It happens a lot. Um, you know, you you you've got a you've got a uh, you got a spouse that wants to be a, a leaf eater and not a meat eater. Okay, cool. Sit yourself right there. Anybody that comes through that door, not yelling friendly, coming in smoke them empty yeah. the magazine yep. at them okay sure no problem and that's that's a fine technique as far as i'm concerned that's called bunkering right yeah. so just because i'm the anti-pc guy if there's any pc people you know tuning into this <laughs> i would make a comment based on jason's comment that there's a big difference between chivalry and chauvinism correct and yeah, it's yeah. our job as men to show civil chivalry towards our wives our significant others and you know what you, people can bellyache and bitch and moan about all this crap and pc and gender bullshit at the end of the day that's our role as the man of the house unequivocally please please leave us a comment tell us how how wrong chris is about that <laughs> <laughs> i feel video. triggered <laughs> yeah. i'm gonna be in man, the toxic here. masculinity is thick yeah. in here oh, and i love it so we can't good. do this anymore <laughs> <laughs> so so to quote jason sawyer we are in a serious deficit of toxic masculinity whole other Amen. side that's Amen. why we started the u.s men's academy strong men are the foundation of strong families and strong you know youngins and again that's a whole very deep rabbit hole but that's something that unequivocally we will not budge on and Amen. we're short on teamwork too yeah, yeah. Teamwork, yeah. teamwork in a family. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. You know, I, I really like what you guys are talking about here is having a fallback location. I like to kind of equate it to how they built castles in medieval times, how they kind of expected that the outer wall might be breached. So they had a fallback location. They called it the keep where they had all their supplies, all their goodies. Now I'm not advocating you put all your eggs in one basket, but having that fallback location in case something happens in, you know, you can't defend one area of your house. You need to be able to fall back and have that place where you have an even better advantage. And you can fortify that, especially in like an SHTF. Mike was talking about putting debris. I mean, I think every prepper should have a, a supply of sandbags or availability to, you know, put things up that can offer you some sort of ballistic protection like that. Uh, and I think that's a really good thing to think about ahead of time, uh, how you want to set that up and what works best in your home. Defense in depth. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I got one more thing I want to touch on here, and this is, a, you know, we're going deep. Uh, I want to talk about mental preparation for self-defense, because I think in the in the prepping community, this is one that is kind of left out a lot because people always think, OK, well, when the, the moment comes, I'm going to be ready to go. But I've you know, from what I've read from, you know, different you know, experiences from police officers and things like that, it's not really necessarily the case. I mean, Tony Blower, matter of fact, he did quote it in that article. And Tony is a, a friend of mine. Heard him say this before. Um, situational awareness is key out there, but we're all human beings, okay? Even though we're grown men, um, we train this stuff all the time. It's human. The first human reaction is a flinch. 
regardless, okay? Because it's like a surprise. Oh, my goodness, something's happening. Oh, my God, somebody's coming in my home. Oh, my God, this guy's throwing a punch at me for no reason. Weaponize the flinch. Um, what Denny's talking about, about um, the speed of draw and stuff like that, that's really important to me because 99% of the time in my day-to-day -day life, I, I have my, my pistol on me, okay, appendix carry. I want to be able to get that tool in the fight as fast as possible. And that's what I consider weaponizing the flinch. But like yesterday with working with a man assistant, Denny, I have so many holes in my game with a rifle because I've spent so much time working on the, it's not silly, but concentrating on one thing, putting my eggs all in that one basket with that pistol and that fast draw and getting that first round on target. There are so many aspects to all of this that, you know, all of us are growing all the time, even us on here. I mean, we're, supposedly experts in the field, but we have so much to grow and do. And I think if we ever stop growing, that's when we stop living, stop, you know, or stop challenging ourselves. That's when we stop growing. Um, but Yeah. Don't let your ego get in the way of expanding your right. knowledge and your capabilities because there are always great equipment and techniques right around the corner that you might not have seen yet. Weaponizing the flinch go, goes just for home invasions and things like that, too. You know, if somebody's coming into your home, I don't know about you guys, but when I'm in my home, my domicile, that's where I go home at the end of the day to relax, chill out. I don't expect somebody to just come tromping through my door. But if somebody does, if I hear a bump in the night, my wife and I both, are, what is that? That's the flinch. Okay. Now it's time for me to go check it out, go make sure everything's okay. Or if something serious was happening, somebody coming through the door, we'd have to weaponize the flinch in a completely different way. You got to be ready for those kind of things. And, you know, this is something that I just thought of while I'm talking. I haven't trained this kind of stuff with my wife. What if you go further step? We're laying in bed. Boom. Hit the timer. Let's see how fast we can get to those positions that we're talking about. Get those um, weapons in hand and get ready to rock and roll if something does happen. You know, uh, what a great drill to practice with your spouse. Um, practice. So you can download uh, the Survival Dispatch Home Defense Plan on our website. Just hover over the store menu. It says free home defense plan. Grab that. It'll help you put together your, your personal home defense plan based on your circumstances. Absolutely. Uh, Mike, I know you were in the military. Uh, you know, what, do you, what are your thoughts on mindset and uh, how can we build that uh, to be ready to go in the moment? So I agree a lot with, uh, with with what everybody else is saying here, but I want to throw out the I want to throw out the immortal words of my first team sergeant uh, that I worked with, and um, it was very wise words. He was a he was a guy he had uh, uh, he had caught the tail end of Vietnam and uh, was still a GB at that point, and um, he told me that killing is the easiest thing to do. We were sitting around, we were sitting around one night, you know, just looking at Ranger TV, you know, sitting around a little fire uh, in Southern Germany. He said, killing is the easiest thing to do. He says, very simple. He says, it's just a pull of a trigger. Living with it afterwards, that's the difficult part. So socially speaking, most human beings in first world countries, even most second world countries are not mentally and emotionally conditioned to just take a life. Okay. Um, first Gulf war, uh, when I went up to the first Gulf war, we had guys, we had guys that, I mean, these guys, these guys were hard, man. They were ready to go. They were, you know, they were, they were serious guys, right. Until they got enough time to start thinking about what was getting ready to come. And then they started thinking twice about it. And I was amazed at the amount of guys that here in a combat unit that outright balked and were, you know, were not well predisposed towards, towards combat. They really weren't. You would have thought that they would have been. But now, of course, we get past a lot of that with training. Right. And, and that's conditioning. That's all we're doing is we're conditioning the mind um, so that you've got you've got neurological memory that that honestly, you're just doing a reflex performing those performing those things. But I'll tell you what, do not do these things lightly. Ever. Um, once it's done, 
You can't take it back. So be very careful. That's why I, I just PID is a huge thing as far as I'm concerned. And and I mean, I, I'm, I'm a big proponent of less lethal measures, stuff like that, man. If I can paintball the crap out of somebody with with uh, uh, with uh, nice balls. Uh, well, uh, the, the pepper balls, yeah. pepper balls are a beautiful thing. Uh, had a had a bunch of had a bunch of kids screwing around um at my neighbor's house when i was living in town um that you know and they were there specifically to harass their daughter and yeah i was sick and tired of it i wasn't playing with it i walked out with the old paintball gun loaded that thing up with a big old hopper full of full of pepper balls and just laid into them and guess what they never came back again because i you know one i wanted my peace and quiet but two they meant harm to her you know, and they were pushing, they were pushing her for, for harm. And I'm not going to have that. So yeah, I mean, psychologically speaking, it's a big thing. Now, if you have a group, and this is one thing that very little uh, gets talked about very little is you get that Alamo syndrome where everybody's, you know, everybody starts getting really paranoid. Everybody's looking out all the time and stuff. And that wears on you. That really, really does wear on you. And if you've, in most people, you know, if they haven't been in the military, if they haven't trained with this kind of stuff, you get one of your neighbors who's an accountant who winds up having to shoot somebody. Man, that is going to Ted is going to wear on that person's mind. Okay, uh, and uh, Bear mentioned I, I was I, I can't believe that I completely never even paid attention to this, but probably one of the absolute most beneficial people that you could possibly have in a preparedness group is a counselor or a preacher. Because that will keep the ball rolling mentally for everybody. Makes sense. Good point. That's a really good point. Really awesome point. Well, guys, I think we covered pretty much everything today. I can't uh, think of much else. Uh, I want to say if you've made it this far in the video and you haven't liked, commented, and subscribed, what in the world are you doing? Get down there, do that for us. And just remember, guys, everything we talked about here is not legal advice. None of us are lawyers. And uh, we're, we can't uh, tell you what your laws in your state are. That's your duty to do if you plan to defend your home and defend your castle. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. It was a great Survival Dispatch News. Uh, awesome having everybody here today. Thanks, guys. All right, thank you all. Everybody stay safe out there.